Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak today. So um, I've split my time, and I think to disclose, first of all, sorry. Uh, I split my talk into five sections today, uh, beginning with some context as to what our biggest barrier is to achieving a cure, and some advances um, in between, and then finally end off a little bit with looking at current HIV cure strategies. So our biggest barrier to achieving a cure is what is referred to as the late of the HIV reservoir. And this is essentially a pool of cells that are infected with HIV where the HIV genome is integrated into the cell's genome. And these cells are typically in a resting state where the virus is able to persist uh, in a very stable manner. Um, and predominantly we see these um, latently infected cells in a pool of CD4 resting memory T cells. Um, and the persistence of these cells necessitates lifelong therapy. If therapy is interrupted, we see that typically most individuals will experience a viral rebound in as little as two months. So we know we have this barrier to a cure, but do we have strong evidence that a cure is even possible? And today, fortunately, uh, we have significantly more case cases that give us clues as to how a cure could be attained. Um, many of you are probably familiar with cases like the Berlin patient, Timothy Ray Brown. Now we have four such cases like the Berlin patient where uh, these individuals obtain a, se a stem cell transplant from an essentially HIV negative donor. And this HIV negative genetic trait is very rare, but we refer to it as CCR5 delta 32, um, where the cells are not able to, or not vulnerable to infection by HIV. And this seems to be the common thread um, shared amongst these individuals, that they obtain these stem cells from a HIV negative phenotype, or HIV um, resistant phenotype rather, um, and this resulted in a sterilizing, what is referred to as a sterilizing cure. However, we cannot transfer this to 38 million infected people globally. Uh, we do have some other insights from cases that lead us towards strategies to achieve what we refer to as a functional cure. Um, so as opposed to sterilizing, this would be a state where an individual is controlling the virus in the absence of any form of treatment, kind of like a cancer remission um, sort of strategy. So the individuals that um, could give us uh, some information or clues as to how to achieve this kind of cure are what we refer to as post-treatment controllers. So these again are a group of unique, new, unique individuals who started treatment very early and upon interrupting treatment were able to control the virus for a very long time thereafter in the absence of any other kind of intervention. We even have two unique individuals that are known of now, two women, who have spontaneously, for all intents and purposes, spontaneously cured themselves uh, through what we believe could be uh, immune responses, unique immune responses. Um, and in these two individuals, they are elite controllers, and there's no evidence of replication competent virus um, in their bodies currently. So we have some unique cases to, to look at to give us some uh, information on strategies, but first we really need to understand this latent reservoir and this essential barrier that we have to achieving a cure. What we know about where the reservoir is and its composition currently um, is while earlier studies and the majority of studies looked only in the blood and in these resting CD4 T cells, we now have studies that could look at multiple sites like the last gift study looking at multiple organs throughout the body and we know that we can find these latently infected cells in multiple sites from the brain to the liver to the gut. So there really are these reservoirs or latently infected cells in multiple sites in the body. We don't, however, yet have a biomarker where we can identify or target specifically which cells are the latently infected ones. So this is a key challenge um, and would be a significant breakthrough to be able to identify such a biomarker. We also know um, from the image, if you look on the right, that there is sharing of viral variants between anatomical sites or movement of these latently infected cells, which tells us that even if we can only look in blood, it is quite representative of viruses that are in other sites in the body. If we now look, um, focus in or zoom in on what this looks like on a cellular level, so within a cell, if we look at the viruses that are integrated in this latent reservoir, we find that um, we know now for a number of years that most of these viruses are defective. They contain large deletions, which are those uh, stretches of white in the genomes represented in the image on the left. 
Um, and if you look at the pie in this particular study, uh, only 2% of viruses were found to be intact um, in, amongst these integrated viruses. So only a small fraction of the reservoir is actually able to give rise to replication competent virus. And in fact, we also now know that this intact portion of the reservoir decays faster than the defective portion of the reservoir. So we know a little bit more about these kinetics, but the reality is that the latent reservoir is still highly stable and persistent. So even if there's only a small fraction that can give rise to replicating virus, it still persists and necessitates lifelong treatment. So some of the mechanisms that um, are employed for persistence is the natural clonal expansion of infected, uh, infected cells. And as cells copy themselves, they also copy the viral genome along with them. But there are newer insights now as to what is happening within the cell in terms of expression of proteins and specific markers that could be associated with silencing of the virus or could be associated with preventing uh, cells like uh, killer T cells from actually being able to target and eliminate these cells. So there are mechanisms driving persistence. This could even include viral mechanisms like the viral NIF protein, which also helps the virus to essentially hide from any kind of immune targeting. So one of the key questions that we've been wanting to answer and over the last few years and the number of studies that now show in terms of what's in the reservoir, we know that HIV evolves um, extensively throughout the course of untreated infection. And when you look in the reservoir, what kind of distribution of viruses do you see? Do you see an archive or a library of all the viral variants that uh, someone uh, acquired over time? Um, or is it quite static? And what we found is that actually most of the viruses in the long-lived reservoir look like those that are in the blood just before you start your treatment. So these latently infected cells are likely turning over all the time until treatment is initiated, where it could be that the treatment is locking in the reservoir into the silent state for a number of years. And so this leads us to new strategies where perhaps there can be an intervention at the time of starting art to restrict the reservoir. Oops. Ah, uh, OK. So um, if we want to evaluate whether or not these strategies, uh, cure strategies, are effective, we need ways to be able to measure the reservoir. And when I say measure the reservoir, I refer to essentially identifying how many cells contain proviruses, or at best, we'd like to know how many cells are capable of producing replication-competent viruses. And now we have a, a range of different technologies that can be used, and they measure on different levels, from basically how many uh, copies of the virus are present, we can now tell whether these copies are defective or intact, um, to being able to sequence the virus genome and determine the integration site of the virus. And many could just tell us how many cells are capable of producing viral proteins or of producing viral outgrowth. Um, however, they all have their drawbacks and benefits. So it's really about deciding what is the best fit for your research question or perhaps using a combination of these to really characterize a particular cohort or, or uh, intervention. I did want to um, briefly just highlight one of the newer technologies that has sort of taken quite a bit of traction in the last few years. This is the intact proviral DNA assay. It is a digital droplet PCR-based assay, um, which is more high throughput, which is an advantage. It also makes use of a larger blood volume, um, also a big advantage, uh, particularly in, in our setting. Um, to not have to do things like leukophoresis, uh, to obtain large volumes of, of um, blood or large amounts of cells. Um, so with a smaller volume of blood, this kind of assay can actually distinguish through using a probe-based system whether or not viruses are intact or defective. And this particular assay was set up um, on subtype B viruses, but it's now been uh, adapted to an extent so that we can use it in other settings where there are a range of different subtypes. Um, that are circulating. So this is a promising technology for some high throughput measuring of the reservoir. Um, and finally, if we move on to HIV cure strategies, so there are many um, that I don't have time to go into detail um, on today, but this ranges from things like immunotherapies, so that would be the use of like broadly neutralizing antibodies that were um, referred to earlier this morning. Um, but typically in combination with another agent like a latency reversing agent. So these latency reversing agents uh, are essentially drugs that are able to activate latently infected cells, although latency 
is facilitated or controlled on different levels. So there's a range of different latency reversing agents. Um, and these would be used in combination with uh, an immune therapy to try to wipe out cells that are producing virus. Unfortunately, this kind of strategy, which has commonly been referred to as shock and kill or kick and kill, has not been very successful to date. Um, some of the challenges include things like these latency reversing agents are not sufficiently potent or they're not broad enough. They're not sort of waking up enough of the latently infected cells. Um, in addition, if we look on the immunotherapy side, we know that a, a big challenge with its cure strategies uh, or prevention strategies is um, resistance to things like broadly neutralizing antibodies. So we do find that particularly when using one antibody, uh, the barrier to achieving resistance can be quite low depending on which antibody is being used. Um, and so this is an additional challenge to techniques that um, utilize these approaches. Um, in terms of gene therapy, this is one technology that we could sort of link back to the sterilizing cure cases where one would perhaps try to replicate that scenario where cells are rendered either resistant to HIV infection or those that are already infected um, can be modified through technologies like CRISPR where a part of the genome is rendered defective and the cell can no longer give rise to replicating virus. Um, in terms of other technologies that um, you might have heard of, it includes also a block and lock strategy, although this is not um, in human clinical trials as yet, but this strategy involves adding an additional drug to put the virus into an even deeper latent state. Um, and the theory behind this is if there's a deeper state of latency, if treatment is interrupted, it would take longer for the virus to rebound. Again, this might need to be used in combination with some kind of gene therapy technology. Um, and finally, it, it does seem that some of these um, latently infected cells might be harder to kill through CD8 T cell killing. It could be through some of these persistence mechanisms, um, as I mentioned previously. Um, but it is also an additional challenge to some of these cure stra strategies. So I wanted to just briefly spend a little bit of time on um, two papers, two key papers that have come out recently employing a combination of these modalities to see what effect they have on the reservoir. Um, and so what you see on the, in the images or figures on your left um, is a Swedish study that applied the knowledge that most of the reservoir seems to be made up of viruses from close to when you start your treatment. Um, and so the question here tr that was uh, being addressed was if you add something else, some other kind of intervention when someone is starting treatment for the first time, can we restrict the pool or the size of that pool of the latently infected cells? And so the modalities that they tried here was to use a uh, broadly neutralizing antibody, uh, 3BNC117, um, which was either just art plus the antibody or art plus the latency reversing agent, remidepsin, um, or all three in combination. And they basically measured the effect of this on the number of infected cells as a measure of the size of the reservoir. And what they found is that, not surprisingly, the latency reversing agent didn't seem to have much of an impact. However, the combination of the BNAB with treatment did decrease the number of infected cells or virus-producing cells shortly after the intervention, about a month after the intervention. So this is telling us that these antibodies can mop up virus at the time that you start art that could potentially be reducing the number of infected cells that end up in the reservoir. So there's sort of some hopeful information in that. Um, of course, one would want to see further from that if it does result in a delay in rebound um, in terms of the efficacy of this strategy. And then finally, the image on the right. Um, is from a study where they now explored a combination of not two different modalities, but a combination of two different broadly neutralizing antibodies. So I mentioned that these antibodies, if given singly, can induce or select for drug uh, antibody resistance. But what if we give a combination of broadly neutralizing antibodies? Does it raise the bar to, to acquiring resistance? And in this particular study, a combination of two BNABs um, was shown to reduce the size of the intact proviral reservoir. And we know that that's the one that we really want to target, right? The intact is the, the fraction that can give rise to, to rebound. And so um, when comparing the effect of in individuals who are only given art, uh, where we, there was no distinction between 
um, size of the intact Proval reservoir, uh, we see that these BNABs could be having an impact. And so this is something that we do want to explore further. We are starting a, a clinical trial in South Africa that is looking at BNAB combination with art initiation as well. And so just to sum up, um, we have advanced significantly in our knowledge regarding what the latent reservoir is and characterizing its properties. However, there is still a lot to be done. Even though we have a range of improved technologies, um, we really need to still refine our understanding of things like mechanisms of persistence, how we identify a biomarker so that we can specifically target these latently infected cells. Um, and I don't expect you to look at that um, big table on the side, but this was just to illustrate um, in the most recent review of the key strategies for achieving a cure that there's a lot to do in a lot of different areas and a lot to explore. Um, some of the, the, the key challenges other than the biomarker include um, that HIV being highly adaptable can um, resist certain modalities like immune therapies and that needs to be overcome. Um, and then finally, as with many other things in um, HIV research, it seems like a combination approach might be the way to go in cure therapies as well. So we cannot just use one modality or one antibody. It's going to have to be a, a combination approach. And so I thank you for your attention, and we'll end up there.